Uh, welcome to Coming Down to Earth, uh, an online summit exploring pathways to more regenerative and uh, ways of being and the potential of transformation through the conflict that we all experience. I am Eva Schoenfer, one of the three hosts, and I'm speaking today to Tom Henfrey. Um, and I thought we might start, Tom, with, um, sh- with you sharing a little bit of your professional background and, and also your journey with conflict, as, as you were saying, that those two kind of intermingle and uh, have journeyed together um, of your life. Yeah, thanks, Eva, and I've found a lens of conflict that you encouraged me to think of in the context of this interview. A really useful one for understanding my professional trajectory and how it fits into a wider context. So to um, sum it up briefly, then, my current position is as research coordinator in ECHLISA, which is a um, a European-wide network of community-led sustainability initiatives, particularly transition groups, permaculture, eco-villages, but arose from an increasing feeling from several years ago that there's a strategic and practical value in these networks collaborating internationally and um, uh, across movements at European level. Um, my, my role in this uh, emerged from an understanding that research is an important part of that. Um, um, emerged naturally from work I've been doing before that time with Transition Network to a, um, uh, uh, a lesser degree with the Permaculture Association in Britain about exploring their relationships with research and uh, with the academy, which uh, at the time had large dimensions of conflict and dissatisfaction. So um, which academy was, was that? So the, the academy in general, in terms of the whole academic system, the university uh, and other professional research institutes. Yeah, right. um, institutionally dominate knowledge production. They have the, uh, the status, they have mm. the, the, the particular types of ways that they work with knowledge, the formats of knowledge they produce. They have higher higher assumed status, assumed value than uh, than most other forms of knowledge. And um, as a result, they monopolise to a huge degree the resources available, the the funding, the prestige, the access to communications channel and channels of influence um, uh, um, that, um, uh, that knowledge production societies need to generate new knowledge, reflect on the knowledge it has, uh, dominated by particular institutional forms that don't sit very well with um, the ethics and values of these uh, of, of these movements and which um, uh, uh, tend to be shared by people involved in social change efforts. Mm. That's um, such a good uh, way to look at them. And, and is that something that's changed over your... Um experience of being within academia is that that is my my perspective from from people I know who've been through it makes me feel like that's got a lot worse um over the years that that yeah that, yeah, that kind of sense of of ownership and control um yeah and to me that's a a natural consequence of the uh, the commodification of knowledge and knowledge generation effectively it's become a uh, a capitalist process where um uh, universities as institutions and individual researchers within them they um, accrue status privilege and power through conforming to uh, uh, to certain narrowly defined criteria of what makes credible knowledge what's um, what's useful and um, and, and relevant and the, um, the institutional demands are increasingly defined by the uh, demands of neoliberal govern- governmentality um, of the uh, demands of a of a capitalist system that holds holds the power ultimately because it holds the resources so in, universities are increasingly competing for 
um, either for money directly through grant funding or through um, uh, for other other currencies, so to speak, which are effectively proxies for money. The um, idea of research impact, the assessment of the quality and value of research is um, reduced to very narrow metrics and they translate directly into the ability of individual researchers, departments and institutions to capture funding. Mm. The um, com- transmission of knowledge through uh, through teaching again is increasingly commodified in in the UK, where uh, a lot of my professional experience has been, and, and where you're based. That's been been magnified by the the introduction of student fees and the sense that um, uh, students are essentially a, a fiscal resource. Uh, uh, universities to compete into attract students not for the the privilege of um, supporting and facilitating young people at a particular stage in the life where they're uh, they're learning and maturing fast and really opening themselves to learning the to um, uh, a greater degree than they might at any other time in their life but simply to uh, capture the fees capture the finances and um, and um, uh, churn out people who are prepared to to jump through the, the types of hoops that are necessary to again to uh, to thrive and prosper in competitive professional situations. Right. So. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was a slight digression, but you were just putting it so coherently. Um, it, it, I just I wanted to hear more. <laughs> I guess being you know having to operate within that kind of context, but you know and having. Um, you know, having such a clear view of that of that disparity between, um, you know, all the all the value, the kind of social value being put on the kind of knowledge and the the way that knowledge happens within the academy, um, but but wanting to be and seeing the value of other forms of knowledge and and uh, other priorities, I guess that for you must have been a, you know quite a strong sense of conflict. Um, yeah, and I think that's a very common situation that people who um, follow academic careers motivated by a sense of social purpose experience. So I really found myself um, at odds um, between the, in a very frustrating fashion between what I wanted to see happen in the world, what I personally wanted to achieve, the um, contributions to society that I um, imagined academic institutions could and indeed uh, should be uh, be making were um, clashing quite fundamentally to what was actually expected of me on a, on a day-to-day basis, the um, types of institutional demands and professional pressures. And I find that a very um, common situation for, um, for uh, professional academics who address it in different ways. I Myself, I, I found a, a different route, which uh, I think we'll talk about in a moment, in a moment, but I also hold a lot of admiration for the, the people who manage to navigate that in ways that allow them to stay in the system as well. And the, uh, uh, I think to uh, be able to conform to those professional pressures and navigate them skillfully enough still to be of service to a bigger picture uh, requires a great deal of skill and dedication and and healthy compromise and the um the nature of my work inherently involves collaborations of very different kinds with people who are um uh, have the level of commitment to continue to work for a higher purpose with uh, within the system and i have a, a great deal of, uh, of respect to the, of the dedication and, uh, and resolve and integrity that that takes. Yeah, but your, your journey has been kind of taking you out of that by stages, has it? What's... Yeah, and particularly um, through transition and permaculture as a, as a context for that, um, um, both as 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 movements, as communities of like-minded people who I could connect with and feel inspired and nourished and nurtured, and in providing methodologies in which, in a very practical sense, I and colleagues have been able to 
apply to this issue of how do we how do we navigate this tension productively and how do we transform this uh, this conflict into um, an energizing force that can enable us to to work creatively to collaborate to these uh, to these positive ends while not being overwhelmed by the by the tensions that arise yeah. um, and in my experience i found um at the time i was um, uh, working at durham university and um, active in transition durham i re returned to the uk in 2008 to to, uh, to work in durham just at the time that the transition movement was really was really taking off I, uh, a friend told me about it i connected with my local initiative and um, through that deepened my interest in permaculture which i'd known um, a little about before but not really not really dived fully into mm. and increasingly as i started to uh, work across that boundary i found myself in a, in a position where my involvement in transition and permaculture as social experiences was uh, an antidote or even a refuge from my day-to-day -day professional experiences mm -hmm. i realized that you know this you know these were spaces and this uh, was a world where i felt at home I felt understood i felt aligned with the the outlooks of the people who um who I was meeting, I felt inspired by the experiences I had, the, uh, the, the encounters, the, the ideas that were around. And increasingly, I uh, looked to locate myself more and more in this far more nurturing and productive um, context through finding ways to almost rehabilitate my skills and the professional resources that I was able to access as an academic in the, the service of the practical aims of these movements. Yeah. And is that is that where what Ecolise emerged from? Is that sense that you could somehow do both um, a, a, and create a different kind of context for that for that research? Yeah. Well, Echolisa is far is far wider itself, and the um, integration of um, of research of knowledge and learning as one of the um, uh, the three initial key pillars of Echolisa. So, um, Echolisa emerged from a set of wide ranging conversations among people who were mostly who were active at national and international level in the. Um, transition permaculture and eco-village movements and out of those conversations initially arose um, communication policy advocacy and knowledge of learn knowledge and learning as three main pillars of action and i along with colleagues like gilles penelops in portugal especially um uh, 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 shaped a lot of the, the definition of the the knowledge and learning pillar and process initially only by by bringing this context that we've uh, that we've talked about yeah. and uh, this um, um, awareness that there's a first of all a practical value in working productively that like the the academy and academics and researchers do have an awful lot to offer to uh, to our movements and that our movements are um, uh, based inherently upon learning processes, action yeah. learning processes of varying degrees of formality, that um, allow ongoing reflection, learning through doing, doing and that these processes could be, um, could be strengthened by the appropriate kinds of interrelationship with formal research, formal knowledge that we can there's a lot of a lot of learning, a lot of reflection, a lot of analysis going on that um, we um, we can make a great value of. Um, there was an interesting uh, difference of perspective between transition and permaculture at the time. It's mm -hmm. the, an important context for the uh, for the work uh, that um, self Michelle Bastian and others did in establishing what became the Transition Research Network was this. Um, the popularity of transition among researchers at the time it sort of became transition became a really fashionable topic and uh, often transition initiatives found themselves bombarded 
with uh, researchers and research uh, research interest, which it was often very challenging to navigate. But it was a realization this um, you know, this could be a really useful useful dynamic, a useful resource. But often in practice, the experience of transition groups who liaise with researchers was that these um, particular professional pressures and uh, forms of work and that we talk about at the start of the the interview uh, would would predominate and they um, it was often experienced as uh, an extractive relationship so researchers turning up and um, drawing on people's time and energy to um, uh, uh, to to gather information data for their research paper for their project for their thesis um, Often the um, uh, uh, people in the transition initiatives who contributed were um, found um, were left feeling quite drained by this. Often, often, often resentful, often skeptical of the values of what's yeah, what's uh, what's this what's this done for us. We also found, in contrast, there were um, uh, uh, there were positive and mutually productive collaborations where people have managed to find the broader context to come together. So drawing on traditions that already exist in academia uh, are quite marginal and uh, they're growing in popularity, but they still remain on the fringes. Traditions like participatory action research, co-inquiry, we uh, uh, worked with a lot in, um, uh, uh, in Durham at the time, uh, where um, in contrast to these situations where researchers, um, the power of researchers dominates the interaction, researchers deliberately let go of that power and seek to come together in a spirit of mutual inquiry, say of working together and saying, well, what are the what are the ways we can collaborate? What's the, um, what's the mutual benefit here? How can the how can the skills, the, um, the capacity of researchers contribute in some useful way to, uh, to what this transition initiative is trying to achieve? Um, we, when that happened, then we found there were all sorts of different ways in which the transition groups would, uh, would benefit. Uh, sometimes it was simply having a reflective space. So uh, uh, a researcher, even using quite conventional methods, taking the time to sit with people, to have interviews, to hold group discussions, would be a sort of respite from the, the, the busyness, the often the being caught up in the doing of transition and would be a really useful and value reflective, valuable reflective opportunity, especially then when that was returned to the transition initiative in the formats that the, the group could digest, could communicate, could use. Um, in Transition Durham, we tended to favour a much more immersive approach. So uh, students would express an interest and other researchers would, would ask, well, what, what can you do? Just come along, get to know the group and Find find your role, find your way to join in, find a context where you can contribute, but it's also a useful research context for you. So in that way, there's a, a privileged deep access to the, the raw mechanics of what's happening, uh, an ethnographic immersion, which really deepens the power and insight of the inquiry. And at the same time, the initiatives um, benefited directly from someone who's hands-on and generally committed and enthusiastic about a particular strand of work, which there might not have been capacity to achieve otherwise. So how um, widespread do you think that attitude was? Because I'm certainly remembering lots of experiences of, of that more in, completely unintentionally, but, but the, the kind of research process that that ultimately felt quite extractive mm. and up here there was no sense that um, anybody was questioning that in the way that you're describing and kind of coming up with creative responses like you know just to kind of um, open out a bit more of a dialogue and a bit more of a kind of creative um, exploration about okay so how could this how could this actually work for both parties probably better for both mm. um, did you get a sense that this was happening elsewhere or was or was Durham a bit of a, a, a crucible? Well, there are um, 
Uh, Durham wasn't the, o- the only place, but as I said, these, the types of experiences you just described tended to be more uh, uh, typical of the norm. And we drew in the, in the uh, design and development of transition research network of all the positive experiences we could find across the network. Yeah. We did, there, were, there are um, uh, the, the research group at Lisbon University that um, uh, Gilles Penelops is part of, I'm associated with now, was, uh, was a, great, a great example. And the climate change impacts and modelling group where largely through Gilles, there was a, um, a, a deliberate decision quite early on to work constructively with uh, permaculture and transition movements in Portugal um, mm. in this spirit, in this uh, drawing on these methods of participatory action research and looking to to come together and to, to work together productively and to develop this um, uh, set of hybrid body of skills. So uh, a lot of the researchers in that research group are people who'd been very immersed in permaculture and transition long term, but also have an intellectual interest. So, uh, who started to work within the university as researchers and do PhDs, develop uh, formal research skills. So, were able to uh, to engage from the uh, from the other way around, uh, if you like. So, already immersed and deeply socialized in this orientation of collaboration of service to to community to humanity and the world and were had that framework to uh, integrate academic and research skills permaculture became a a methodology for um uh, for doing that deliberately for um, uh, for understanding more deeply and creating practical approaches to um, this this hybridity, this sort of this uh, this bringing together, and uh, uh, particularly by um, creating contexts where um, um, where people could break through their institutional constraints. We found in transition and permaculture these contexts already existed because where people weren't thinking about self-interest, they weren't thinking about um, about uh, uh, institutional prestige, about so uh, they were thinking collaboratively, thinking about solidarity, they were working towards these higher social and environmental goals and already had very sophisticated social methodologies so by creating contexts where researchers and transition and permaculture activists came together using the facilitation methods for social processes that we'd learned through transition through social permaculture and we created these these contexts where the um uh, the sort of institutional constraints of the academy vanished and people were brought into this space where um, people were coming together and thinking, well, what, what can we achieve together in service of these wider goals, these, um, these ethical goals and consistent with, uh, uh, with our values? And then I found them it's a typical um, design orientation in permaculture that you don't seek to control the elements you, you think bigger picture you create the context once there's an appropriate ecological context when you're permaculture garden you uh, create the conditions where the right plants will grow the right animals will come along and you create optimum conditions for your your system your agroecological system to self-organize thinking in this agroecological perspective about research then when we created these contexts for mutual learning then the types of researchers who'd show up were already had this infinity already had this uh, this orientation were typically very frustrated in their professional environments and to see people come out and to, to lighten up and start to express themselves and to free and be able to, uh, uh, to, to start to work in ways which made sense to them and to uh, find new, new values, new applications in their, their skills and perspective was one of the, the most rewarding aspects of that, that phase of work. Yeah, such a lovely parallel to, to use those um, use those principles in just the same way or in a similar way and, and have really similar results but you know, farming humans 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that was my yeah, and that was in a personal sense. That was my my experience of the first um, national transition network conference I went to, which was in Battersea, London. I think in two thousand and nine. Uh, uh, I literally uh, felt felt like I'd um, had the experience, but a um, uh, a plant has when it's cultivated in a permaculture garden. It's just this this context where every turn I meet this yeah, this uh, 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 another person who inspired and uplifted me. Another idea which really um, enriched how I was thinking. Another workshop which would open up new new possibilities, and I got a really sense of the. Um, of the social ecology that uh, transition was was creating there, and saw how that could be uh, applied and broadened, and using using permaculture explicitly as a, as a methodology. Uh, the core concept we used in that methodology was was one of edge that we still employ. So the again from from ecology, the the observation that. Ecotones, edges, but places where two different ecosystems meet tend to be the most productive. They tend to be the most diverse. It's where most tends to be happening in an immediate sense in terms of growth, and also over an evolutionary time scale. That's where a lot of the evolutionary, the genetic change happens. That's the, the engine for further creativity. Um, and applying that in a in a social context, then any any. A uh, situation of apparent conflict is um, a potential edge uh, uh, because what we have in a conflict is a diversity of perspectives, with a, a diversity of, of interests, a diversity of capacities. And uh, so that when they're brought into appropriate relationship, there's always a reconciliation that can lead to emergence. There's a shift into a higher uh, um, uh, 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 an emergent state, uh, a higher perspective where the apparent conflict can be seen as different perspectives on the same goal that can be brought into a way of working that's synergistic and mutually productive. Mm -hmm. Power is key to that, and uh, that was a, a crucial dimension from the start. And we mentioned how the relationships between transition groups and other sustainability practi practitioners and researchers tend to tap this power imbalance. Researchers tend to call all the shots because they have the, have the capacity, have the funding when it's a funded project, have the, the institutional resources. So um, these dispiriting extractive relationships we talk about tend to happen when those power relationships translate into forcing the, um, uh, the a subordinate party to conform to these institutional constraints so they're being exported into the research field again when we shift those power relationships by bringing into into awareness this bigger picture which in the which transition and permaculture automatically provide transition is how do we how do we self-organize in our community to mm -hmm. to achieve what we want for it to become the type of place we want in the context of these incredibly pressing and important global issues yeah. again permaculture these globally relevant ethics of earth care people care fair share once they become the orientation then there's a, a real shift in frame and a real shift in dynamic which allows everybody in the interaction to be coming together and working within that big picture or whatever fragment of that picture the researchers interests and the interests of the, the transition group or of a, or of a community uh, where they where they overlap well that's fantastic that's that's really um really helpful <laughs> the input around those kind of dynamics with um with power and framing um, that they can make such a difference to something that can feel kind of tense and, and conflictual and, and non-productive into something which, you know, feels much more um, dynamic and, and, and uplifting and um, uh, in a really purposeful and a really positive way. It's really exciting. Yeah. And the shift um, of scale that's, um, that's arisen through 
um, through Echelisa and, and, and an innovation in Echelisa is, uh, as far as I know, it was the first time that any um, new organisation, new, um, new, uh, new initiative of that scale within our movements had really integrated this awareness of research and this um, wish to work productively with uh, researchers into its organisational fabric, so to speak, and that also through the, the stepping up, the stepping up of scale, the mobilising of our collective resources at that scale has and allowed the uh, the transformative impact of that orientation to become uh, ever more present and powerful. Now we're starting to starting to find that the um, uh, the credibility. Is is growing, I think, through the uh, increasing questioning of the um, of the status quo over time, and uh, Echelisa has become a, um, a, a quite a visible marker of that among its certain research landscapes at European scale. So, of that that expertise and that particular orientation is now being welcomed as an antidote to the, the limitations of, um, of conventional working. So that's really allowing us to sort of go beyond uh, overcoming the constraints of the dominant knowledge production regimes in isolated interaction to move towards institutionalizing these um, these new orientations again by finding the finding the partnerships with, with the institutions who are already open to um, uh, to that way of working, who want to do more, and they see how the freedom of Echelisa from the types of institutional constraints or Echelisa being organised along very different premises and values but are more in line with the lived values of the researchers involved, that uh, enables those um, uh, uh, those institutions to to do more to push the boundaries more of uh, the possibilities that are available within their own institutional setting. At the same time, we're still a very marginal marginal player and actor, but then there's a um, uh, uh, there's a, a very healthy and positive synergy between the. Um, the greater the greater status, the greater capacity to mobilise resources, the um, uh, greater power in some respects of of these institutions beyond what we can achieve now, and in some respects beyond what we could aspire to, because to do so we'd have to shift and become a type of organisation and network that's no longer consistent with the uh, with the values of the networks that we're, we're working for and uh, that, that, uh, uh, that make up our membership. So, right. And this this um, uh, this edge and this shift of perspective is, um, uh, I think, starting to become relevant to wider debates, particularly at EU level, about sustainability, about the uh, the policy orientation that's. Um, that can best support that and the types of knowledge production, the types of research that are necessary to inform that and to uh, to achieve that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, really exciting, exciting times. I'm wondering about you and your and your kind of process within that whole journey, because I know that um, you know your your shamanic practice is is a really kind of important. Um, focus for you an increasingly important focus and I wonder what did you know did that grow up as part of that whole um, kind of uh, dialogue that was happening in you know between academia and um, permaculture and transition or was that a strand that had always been there how did that how did that start for you and and, and where's it going <laughs> yeah. well that's a it's a lifelong uh, in, with hindsight, it's a lifelong outlook, a lifelong, a lifelong interest. I've always felt um, an affinity with the, the hidden worlds, the certain levels of reality that, um, that shamanism brings into lived experience. I've always known they're there. I've always um, worked with them to the extent I was able, and I've always had this sense of intrigue, this sense of, of mystery uh, the, uh, about it. So when I discovered 
uh, neo-shamanism as a, a set of practices and, uh, and an outlook, it, it already made perfect sense to me. I, um, uh, it was through the, um, the works of Carlos Castaneda, the um, uh, teachings of Don Juan and so, that I uh, first become became inspired by the notion that this, uh, despite the, uh, the likely inauthenticity of Castaneda's work, he does a very uh, impressive job of, of communicating the, um, this notion. The world is far uh, bigger and richer than our mundane experience suggests, and that through appropriate practices, we can um, align ourselves with that better. We can open up to that, these depths of reality, and we can work with them to achieve practical outcomes in life. Mm. So for, um, from that time, that was a strong intellectual interest of mine, which also fitted with the, uh, the, broader, the broader view of the world that uh, is emerging from, from science. I was always my... Uh, initial training and intellectual orientation was scientific. I uh, initially studied biology at university and found that that enabled me to get closer to the magic, to understand when you understand nature more deeply and its workings, its richness, its marvels just uh, uh, become more and more apparent. And I always I found science was a a mechanism for encountering the sense of awe more deeply, really becoming aware of the, the majesty of creation. Quantum physics, quantum theory reveals that magic at the heart of the very innermost workings of reality. And there's um, the lived experience that can be cultivated through dedication to shamanic practice. Uh, uh, I, I found completely consistent with that as a way of living living the quantum world in a sense in uh, in direct experience my own relationship with that shifted from intellectual to practical as a a healing journey initially and that was something in the uh, i think an outcome of this this conflict, this service uh, tension, an early an early outcome when I was doing my PhD, I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, and um, uh, providently encountered somebody who was experienced in shamanic work, received the shamanic healing, which changed my relationship with um, uh, with that condition and allowed me to understand it as a manifestation of an interior conflict, an embodied, uh, embodied conflict, a uh, failure on my part to um, uh, come to terms with what the more difficult aspects of my inner experience and my outer lived experience were telling me. So that set me on a journey to dive deep into that, to integrate the parts of the, um, the all the parts of myself fully in order to uh, really experience my place within the this wider reality, this wider earthbound reality, and wider cosmic reality that uh, shamanism shows up. Mm. Uh, it's very. Um, I found it increasingly as I've deepened my understanding and my practice. I found the alignment with permaculture in particular, a lot of this orientation. Um, it's been increasingly obvious in a sense, and this uh, this concept of edge is central to both. So, in an equivalent way to where uh, uh, in research we deliberately create a pr productive edge and navigate this this edge between the uh, the different potentials and outlooks of academia and uh, grassroots environmentalism, and. Um, shamanic practice is essentially weaving this edge between the seen and the unseen to um, uh, uh, to uh, be bring into experience these higher perspectives these broader outlooks on uh, on reality so my at the time i started all this work i was talking about i found uh, in this 
the situation where my day-to-day life and experience was dominated by the professional demands of an academic life to which I was quite ill-suited in uh, hindsight, uh, found that dominating my uh, my commitment to, to activism, to the type of work that's going on in transition and permaculture, and the my dedication to um, to self growth, to spiritual inquiry, was a uh, as a distant third to that. Um, that to me is um, a reversal of the the appropriate orientation. So uh, the um, the sense of any sense of purpose I found in academia and research was uh, through it being a useful tool for action, for constructive action in the uh, you know in the service of uh, of humanity learning to live harmoniously with each other and with nature and uh, as part of a finite biosphere and and from a human point of view and from the perspective of shamanism i've come to see that as a as uh, part of a Whole, a whole deeper purpose, the unfolding of nature, the unfolding of biosphere, like this uh, incredible experience of life on Earth is in a state of emergence now. So we we don't know for sure if um, in the history of Earth there's been a, another intelligent, techn- technologically sophisticated species that has the technical capacity to destroy the biosphere. We know the biosphere has... Uh, uh, been through several mass extinction events in the past, and were you know well on the way to creating another without a, um, uh, a massive change of direction. Or it's um, certainly the uh, a huge level of extinction is is inevitable already. And that's a another of these situations of apparent conflict, which is inviting a step into into this emergent state. Uh, like what what is the reality for the biosphere of becoming self-conscious through the human experience and can we as the, the species that is has the great privilege and adventure of um of experience in that self-consciousness and this massive power can we can we achieve the maturity that's necessary to come back into alignment with the um, with the evolutionary unfolding and, uh, of the earth and allow the allow this shift between uh, I think the um, uh, the model of the, the biosphere and noosphere is a very uh, one can we uh, can we sh- return to uh, to being a um, uh, a contributor to the unfolding of the diversity and richness of uh, of life on earth from this new perspective of self-consciousness and of uh, isolation of alienation actually from our from uh, um, a condition of ecological harmony and uh, and integrity right. one of the powers of um of shamanic practice uh, that i'm really seeking to work with deep, deeply at the moment is that it brings that into direct lived experience so these notions go from being an abstraction to something that through the shamanic journey which is the um, the core of the, the type of shamanic work that I do that allows the hidden aspects of nature to become directly accessible to us it allows us to experience directly and in doing so bring into our day-to-day activities this um, sense of affinity with nature, this ecology of our inner experience. We are not isolated individuals. We're not even isolated spirits that have been born into consciousness. We're integrally a part of nature, of of terrestrial life, of the um, of the biosphere, and uh, shamanic practice is a very powerful tool for understanding and living that more deeply. Um, when we when we use it to address both particular issues we might be encountering in our encountering in our daily lives, and I think if we can start to translate it more systematically into into activism. Uh, into practical action can that 
can that orientation, can we develop a form of shamanic activism where the um, direct lived access to and connection with nature becomes something that, say, an orienting force within action. And in doing so, the whole power of the biosphere, the whole, the whole weight of four billion years of evolutionary history and the, the full diversity of richness of life living on Earth now and uh, into the future is walking with us. It's uh, allying with us in, uh, in very meaningful senses in that in uh, in that work so i feel that these are possibilities i'm just beginning to wake up to and explore uh, personally i know some some people like starhawk in particular sandra ingerman to a, a degree who's a very well-known shamanic teacher uh, are uh, are working with themselves and i feel there's a there's a great common great potential for a a deeper map marriage between shamanic practice and environmental and social activism and has been achieved before. And I think to, to get back to transition, this whole field of inner transition, which has been, for me, a, a vital part of, of the nurturing experience that transition has provided for me. And I think that's a great innovation, this recognition that these um, uh, these uh, personal and collective inner shifts, the psychological and cultural shifts are as important a part of activism and action and uh, as the, the outer, the practical action we achieve. The two are inseparable and go together and um, shamanic practice is among the, I think the, the many tools that we can, we can draw on and bring into that, that emerging field. Mm. I love I love what you're talking about and and um, yeah really really resonates and feels really exciting particularly I guess um, you know a sense of really uh, not exactly formalizing but really strengthening that sense that um, there are other ways of experiencing um, and that, that that what we what we bring back from those uh, inner and you know outer uh, journeys. Um, can really enrich our our activism and our and our potential to be effective in the world on behalf of the on behalf of the the biosphere. Um, I guess you know I see within transition and within other movements there's just such a strong um, reaction to that in some ways from people who um, for a whole range of of you know quite understandable reasons uh, find that a, a quite a threatening um, idea and I you know wonder if you've been involved in conversations like that of, of kind of like oh you know we've got, we've got time for this it's often you know the way you you describe it is so strong and powerful it's often sort of written off as being fluffy and um, you know uh, yeah, there's lots of of ways in which that kind of experience gets denigrated even within our movements, uh, let alone in the wider world. Yeah, and I think uh, I think there are a lot of good reasons for those for those uh, uh, for those attitudes. I think there's there's um, there's a lot of value in them if they're not taken too far. And so in the in the history of permaculture, there was. Um, strong resistance initially to it becoming uh, appropriated by you know, new age thinking, spiritual ideas, lest it, that undermine its uh, its credibility. That's that's shifting massively in in permaculture, and I think the um, uh, uh, transitions really helped there and through this through this emphasis on transition. I think there also remains a very um, uh, clear danger of spiritual bypassing if um, as can quite easily happen the uh, uh, activism is simply reduced to inner work and personal work rather than the, the inner work being part of how we resource ourselves individually and collectively to to achieve more practically in the world and that's um, um, yeah an, an equally unproductive extreme to one that completely um, uh, excludes the possibility of any uh, of the of the validity of any inner experience. 
I found in my explorations of the links between uh, permaculture and, and shamanic practice, then there's a, um, uh, uh, a useful trajectory. And this um, uh, uh, comes from the practical orientation of, uh, of shamanism. And uh, to me, what, how, I'd, how I define shamanism, if pressed to make a definition, that would always include that it's journey and work that's done to achieve some sort of practical outcome in the world. So often, often that's um, a healing outcome on the personal level, but it can be the potential applications of uh, shamanic practice are, um, are unlimited. You can literally a uh, journey with any intention towards uh, towards uh, any end, and it's uh, likely to uh, to produce real world consequences. So, I've had quite a lot of conversations with people in the um, in the permaculture movement over the past few years as I prepare to uh, to uh, bring my ideas into that field more publicly. And I've encountered a range of responses, so from the, the people who already um, share those interests but feel um, feel their vo- feel silenced by this 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 uh, anti spiritual orthodoxy that's uh, that's arisen from those who are who are sceptical, um, uh, of whom that isn't isn't a, um, uh, a a prominent part of their own experience and outlook, and share this this caution about uh, about um, uh, uh, losing sight of the you know, the actual real world work. To me, a um, one thing that's really interesting about shamanism and its practical applications is they don't they aren't prescriptive about a belief system so this uh, a shamanic journey for example it can be uh it can be interpreted in any number of ways and i um i don't see any uh you know, thinking scientifically thinking i don't see any empirical basis for discriminating between the, the hypotheses at one extreme that this um uh you know, this uh, broader reality that we experience through the shamanic journey is um, uh, does have some uh, uh, some existence beyond our experience. Through to the other extreme, that it's simply an exercise in broadening the uh, the parameters of our imagination. Uh, I was actually surprised how quickly in um, uh, my own shamanic practice I came to consider that distinction as as largely irrelevant. Um, but what it what it means in practice is that um, anybody can undertake a shamanic journey, and anybody can apply it to useful effect, regardless of how they interpret and what their belief is. So, um, uh, at any point in the permaculture design process, for example, you can journey to uh, uh, to explore a particular problem, a particular issue. Maybe it's connecting with the piece of land you're working with or with the, uh, the, the group you're in with, um, with your project. Maybe it's to journey to ask a shamanic guide for advice on a, a particular design problem, a particular issue. And the the insights and the teaching that provides, they can be applied, you know, whether, whether you think it's um, uh, these, these, these spirits do actually exist independently of it, or whether you simply think it's, uh, it's an exercise that's helped you to take um, uh, uh, a shift in your perspective, uh, just a purely imaginative exercise. Uh, and I've, I think in making shamanic practice accessible we have to uh, uh, to understand that there's a uh, a range of orientations a, a range of perspectives and not uh, presume that any uh, any one of these is more or less valid than, uh, than the others mm. yes, I, I like how lightly you're holding that and and it reminds me of um something that i read years ago um saying that the um can't remember the words exactly but basically saying that our imaginations are, are our way to god mm. and that you know we we think of our that in 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 western culture we think of our imaginations as a kind of added extra and you know it was only in your imagination mm. um but uh, you know in my own kind of um practice along kind of shamanic lines 
um, I've come to think of, of my imagination as a sense, which I need to learn how to use because I can just imagine things. I can do that. Um, so, so part of my practice has been to um, become sensitive to when I feel like I'm just imagining something or when something's actually interacting with me at that level, yeah, you know, through that, through that kind of sense that I have. Um, yeah, and having 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 said said that, and um, uh, sort of in, in in the light of this what you just made about the you know, imagination being you know uh, something far more powerful and important than is generally given credit for, then I found while it's perfectly um, you know, perfectly reasonable and valid and useful for somebody to um, explore shamanic journey and in a purely practical sense, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as, as many people do, then I found that um, everybody I know who's really committed to shamanic work has experienced this ontological shift in their, their basic premise. So this world of spirits, we only encounter it through our experience and it could be attributed to imagination but the richness of that experience and the power of its potential application in um, in everyday life becomes much stronger when one really embraces this not as not as just some imaginative exercise but separate from live reality but as a a wider perspective on reality itself um, when we take that on board, it's starting to link with ideas like the, the plur of Earth, which is one which is becoming much um, uh, increasingly prominent, uh, uh, originating in academia and academic trends like academic areas like degrowth and in the world of, of the work of Arturo Escobar, but really legitimising the diverse ways of experience in the world that um, uh, different peoples have particularly um, ar arising from indigenous and post-colonial movements where uh, people are, are asserting their right to understand the world in, uh, in the ways that make sense to them and recognising that there's both uh, there's an ethical imperative to accommodate these um, uh, uh, diverse ways of experiencing the world and that that's also necessary for us to that diversity is an essential feature it's an inherent feature of our of of humanity and our status as a as a species and um the cultural diversity is uh, um central to our ability to um engage with biological diversity and to uh, for this um uh, to be uh, uh, for uh, living harmoniously with and enriching the ecological diversity of the world. So and this, if you summarise the, the basic problem orientation that those of us in industrialised societies who are we're working with transition permaculture and other, other efforts to create alternatives, then we've, we've grown up with uh, a way of thinking, being socialised into a, a way of thinking that doesn't fit with the reality the, uh, of um, of uh, needing to live as a, as an abundant species on uh, in a finite biosphere, and we 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 know that the um, some of the fundamental premises of this society are um, are inaccurate in the sense that they they don't guide us effectively to um, uh, to work towards. Um, cultural, civilizational, or planetary survival. So we know that we 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 need a shift, and uh, um, the techniques that allow us to uh, to make such a shift that open up other possibilities to us, of which shamanic practice is uh, is um, the one I've I've personally found most uh, most used to myself. I I think that that's there's a um, maturity of the whole inner transition perspective and related movements which uh, I think can link with this notion of the, of the pluriverse and that they become tools for exploring the, the new diversity of cultural perspectives of, uh, of cultural innovation that will allow us to, uh, to find this, um, uh, this harmonious integration of society, culture and ecology on the planet.
Mm. Yeah, and which which kind of takes you back. It, it reminds me of your first or an early point you were making about the kind of um, the way in which our our ways of knowing uh, have kind of been colonized too, um, mm. and that and that's kind of um, been structurally uh, sort of set in um, the academy and that you know a lot of your work in different ways has been to kind of break that open and widen that out and include um, other ways of knowing and and you know include and um, uh, highlight the value of a range of different um, other ways of knowing which you know feels like a, a sort of crucial contribution Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the uh, the I think a nice conclusion of that is when these the current culturally dominant ways of knowing cease to become uh, uh, prescriptive, and they situate themselves within a wider ecology of ways of knowing, and the real value of them in science. Uh, all methods of acquiring have immense power they have immense value and that's part of why they've achieved their status uh, so we certainly need to retain them retain the best of them but and as uh, the general theme we've been talking about a uh, within a wider context which sits them alongside other perspectives yeah this feels like a, a a good place maybe to round off our conversation is there have you got any kind of closing thoughts or last things that you want to bring in here? Well, I, uh, I, I, liked, I liked the summary point we've, uh, we've reached and um, I really, I've really enjoyed this as, as an experience of, uh, of emergence, of uh, coming into this, uh, this, this particular summit. We, uh, it, wouldn't, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't necessarily be obvious where, where research comes into it, where, um, uh, where these types of issues fit in and um, I hope that they've added to the diversity of the conversation at the same time this uh, this lens of this lens of conflict that you've uh, uh, encouraged us to adopt in this uh, in this conversation has uh, I think really really been helpful in in creating new insights for me on what I've done what, uh, what, what I do the types of fields I uh, I work in, and I think that's um, uh, that, that's that's an example, case in point of uh, of what we've been talking about. And when we when we start to think about conflict as a productive and creative force that enables transformations in uh, many many different fields of activity and research and knowledge generation are simply one of them. Mm. Yeah, there's something really lovely, I think, about that. The kind of curiosity that comes in with with research and the kind of you know slight detachment which I'm sure you don't always feel at all but there's a sense of um you know that that's a really useful energy to bring to a conflict it's like what's going on here and you know how can we how can we reorient these things so that they actually right really nourish one another and feed one another you know a sense that there aren't necessarily any wrong things happening in here there may just be wrong relationships um or power imbalances or you know i I, i'm i'm leaving the conversation feeling kind of quite quite a lot sort of uh, more space in in me and my way of kind of looking at things uh than i started and yeah i think yeah feel i feel yeah lots of things (laughs) really interesting conversation uh, great, thanks. And you certainly helped to uh, strengthen that spirit of curiosity and first for inquiry in me. So thanks very much, Eva, for inviting me to be part of this. Oh, yeah. yeah you're very welcome. Thank you so much, Tom, for your time. And goodbye. Yeah. Yeah, see you soon. Bye.